group. Look at this group of professors. <laughs> All right. So if it wasn't fun the first time, it's going to be fun the second time as well. Because what we're trying to do is to try to give them an environment to help them understand the interaction between here and there. So this is a very different case. Have fun. Be safe with them. <laughs> All right, good morning, good morning. I'm Glenn Williams out of the Mississippi Delta. I am so happy to be here with you all. We're just going to do a brief introduction of ourselves uh, before we get started with the case. So uh, I'm a professor at Delta State University and I teach a little, little small business finance and economics uh, every now and then. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, interacting with you all to, you know, so you can find out more about us as we find out more about you and your needs in the classroom. So. All right, I, uh, my name is Trisha Shrum and I'm a professor of, of community entrepreneurship at the University of Vermont. Um, and I have, I'm trained as an economist, I'm an environmental and behavioral economist, but my specialty in entrepreneurship arises not from like the billions of years I spent in grad school, but instead because I started a nonprofit, I had an idea inspired by my research, and I took that idea and turned it into a global uh, reach project that has now reached millions of people. So that whole process of starting that uh, venture has taught me more than I could have ever learned um, uh, from a book. Um, so I'm here to help um, people get ready for that process themselves so they can avoid some of the mistakes I made. Awesome. Thank you, Tricia. So my name is Alex Glossenberg, and I am an assistant professor at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. It's a mouthful, Loyola Marymount University. Um, I am in an entrepreneurship center, so I teach entrepreneurship, and I'm particularly interested in entrepreneurs around the world. Um, I began my entrepreneurial journey when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Very unorthodox way to start an interest in entrepreneurship. But what I saw living and working in South Africa was that the way a society goes is largely determined upon how its people discover, evaluate, and exploit opportunities. Not just business opportunities, but social opportunities. Whether they're constantly looking for solutions to social problems. And so my interest was how do we support that how do we generate better ideas, more ideas, high growth ventures? And that's what I study. I teach international entre entrepreneurship right now, and I've started a few different social ventures to help uh, facilitate and support people's career development around the world. So that's a little bit about our background, mm -hmm. and we're going to ask them a few questions about their background. Yeah. Awesome. So we mm -hmm. we're, had a chance to speak to some of you, um, Chris, Dimitri, Noah, Antonio. Like, sounds like you all have varied interests. You um, come from all over the, all over the uh, college. And can we get a show of hands for who, who has actually taken an entrepreneurship course? Cool. How about a business course? Okay. All right. Who has started an entrepreneurial venture? Oh, nice. Awesome. Diverse and varied interest. Well, today we're going to be talking broadly about the difference and the, um, the emergence of a business concept as opposed to just a business product. But I'll turn it over to Trisha. So, to start off, we're going to talk about this case. Uh, but we need some volunteers to come up because we're going to do a bit of a hands-on demonstration. Yeah, so those of you who have hands, Pun this is for you. Intended. Yeah. And we're not going to grill you, so even if you didn't do the reading, which I'm sure none of ever, there's no one, no, everyone did the reading, of course. Uh, but let's get about like four to six volunteers. Hands up. All right, you. I can there promise that you either Two, will or will not enjoy three, this four. activity. Okay, that, that's right. Four is fine. Okay, so. Um, now, okay, so you guys are going to be our Eleven massage feet. therapists. Okay. And you, too, are going to be our lucky customers. So, <laughs> if you're cool with that, so just stand in front of, here, come over here. Okay, so you stand here, you stand here. And, and so while we're, we're going to start our discussion. Oh, these chairs, that's yeah. a good idea. Yep. Yeah, okay, so have a seat. They have to be relaxed. Customers. Customers. We don't want, be we don't want to do stress. Stressed out. Who tall. else wants to take a seat? We don't, <laughs> there we go. Any of that. All right. Okay. All right. no I think we just need to. I think we're just going to stick okay. with that. Yeah. So now, um, you guys, while we're going to talk about the case a little bit, and all we want is you guys to kind of like 
work some massage, okay? A little deep okay. tissue, a little like, <laughs> just kind of get in there. Um, and then we'll come back to you, okay? So you guys go, just. Yeah, start massaging, Sorry. please. Okay, cool. Yeah, there you go. All right, so <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna leave them to it, because then we're gonna come back, to, we're gonna come back to this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and in the meantime, I'd like to get a quick synopsis of the case. So who's got, who can just kind of give us a quick rundown of what happened with Mark Juarez? So what's going on in this case? Who's the chief protagonist? We already used up our like early, early volunteers, so now we got to get the second <laughs> wave. Yeah. I was volunteering to so summarize the <laughs> okay, you want to do that? <laughs> okay. Anyway. All right, so we got this guy, Mark. Interesting man. <laughs> got a lot of different talents. And um, Mark likes to travel to Europe a lot. He goes broke a lot, fortunately. <laughs> uh, works a lot of odd jobs. And he decides to become a massage therapist, basically. Um, in Germany. Yeah, in Germany, which is key because he doesn't speak German, but you can learn massaging without the language barrier. Uh, for Mark, Mark has a dream about a ball with uh, four little uh, legs and then four <laughs> smaller balls to kind of use as a massage tool. Yeah. And uh, we're basically asking, is that a good idea or an opportunity? Um, and so that's where, we're, that's where we're at. Yeah, he literally has a dream. It comes to him in a dream and a vision. But the other issue is that he's still poor and it's really <laughs> hard for you to launch like, a new design and patent that new design and like navigate through like the legal system of patenting and design when you have no money. So the question is kind of like, is it worth it? And to what extent is it worth it? Mm -hmm. All right, let's give a hand for our yeah, volunteers. <laughs> So okay. why don't you, why don't you guys, you know, we don't want you to have to be too stressed out. Go ahead and take a seat. Yeah, hopefully that was wrapped in. Yeah. You guys aren't quite done yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so you guys think we get two more volunteers. volunteers. We'll keep the chair. We'll no, keep it's all right, the chair. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We'll keep two the more chair. volunteers. Two more volunteers. To, uh, get a massage. Three, two, yeah, baby. Three, two, massage. All right, cool. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> Nobody else wants a massage? Okay, can you come on up? Okay. All right, who else wants a massage? We got one more massage. Who, who has Here, never Alex, had a massage in, in their life? This is your first <laughs> experience. <laughs> Free massages Alex, by well, experts. Why don't you sit down for a second? And we'll, awesome. There we go. We got it. Go thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now you guys keep going because um, it's hard work, right? Yeah. This is um, your next set of clients. How are your hands feeling? My thumbs like kind of hurt. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, let's, let's ask them. Is she, is she doing it right? It's all right. Are you just comfortable? Dimitri, so, how's, it, how's it going? Is, is Ryan doing a good job? She's not trying hard enough. <laughs> Ryan. I'm giving it my all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how long have you been doing it? So what do you think? Uh, do you, how are your, your hands? My thumbs are getting tired. Oh, oh my. Really tired. So are you saying, like, well, you know, our, fortunately, you guys only have to do this for 45 minutes, because yeah. that's how long we're going to be talking. <laughs> 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 I'm totally kidding. You're not, um, give, you got to give them their money's worth, but, uh, but then, you're, then we'll, we'll, we'll cool it over here. But imagine having to do that for eight hours a day. Yeah, I wouldn't. Eight hours a day, <laughs> like five days a week, like 40 hours a week, and then what happens? What happens if you just keep doing the same thing? Anyone has anyone ever worked as like an ice cream scooper? Yeah, who's worked at Cold Stone? I know y'all have worked at Co Cold Stone. It's like a popular place to work. Yeah, so if you've ever gotten carpal tunnel, anyone? It's not fun, right? And then that's your living. If you have a carpal tunnel, you got now you got a real problem because you can't do your job. So what have we identified here? What, what's the, what have we identified with? You're, you're working as a massage therapist, and you have a... You have a need, exactly. So we have a need that we've identified. A need. Now, um, you could also say, you know, we have a problem. So we have a need, we have a problem. And that is the first step that we, the first thing we have to identify when we're thinking about starting a new venture, starting a new project, a new business concept, is we have to identify a need or a problem. Because if there's no need, there's no, no one's going to buy your stuff, right? Uh, why do you buy things? Either one. Right. Do you like to buy things that make your life worse? 
<laughs> and so for like sometimes like the really long textbooks that cost like $150, sometimes that might be an example, but no. do you ever voluntarily spend your money on things that, are, uh, that don't add value to your life? I do. Yeah? yeah do you have some buyer's remorse? <laughs> Well, you know, there are some arguments that, you know, smokers or whatever doing things and buying things that aren't necessarily adding long-term value, but still you're, ha you're serving some sort of desire or need. Okay, so first let's go ahead and give our volunteers a round of applause again. <laughs> and this time you guys can actually sit down, so cool. I appreciate that. Um, so in order to, um, so now we've, we've identified a need, and what has Mark done? So he's, he has is experiencing this firsthand. Maybe it's like the pain in his arms is like causing this vision to appear to him in his dream. So now we have our, our vision of this massager. So he identified a need and now he has a solution. Um, a solution for that problem. So wh what do we call this? So for those people who have been into in a few uh, business uh, classes or entrepreneurial classes, what do we, what, uh, there's like a wonky term for when we have, when we're gonna able to create a product or a service that adds value to an individual's life. We're gonna make the world better and we call that a value, value proposition. So what's a value proposition? You opened your mouth like you wanted to say something. <laughs> um, kind of just like weighing the pros and cons of like, what it could bring to somebody. Yeah, so thinking about how your product brings some value to a customer, right? That's a, pretty, that's a good definition. What else? Um, so, th so we have a value proposition. And this is a really important part of any business strategy. Uh, so the value proposition is the fancy term that you put into your business plan, your business strategy, that basically says, I've created something that makes people's lives better. And because it makes people's lives better, then they might actually do what? What do we need to do in order to sustain our business? We've made our product. We've got to sell it, right? So the only way that we can possibly sell a product and make money and turn this product concept into a, into a business concept is if we are creating value enough that people are willing to fork over their hard-earned money um, to buy our product. So that's our value proposition. Now, here we've identified, now we have a value proposition. Does, um, who, who have we identified? Who has Mark identified as someone who needs his little happy massager? Massage therapist. Um, so we can say that we have a target market of massage therapists. Okay, so do you think that massage therapists you know, our, our, would you buy as a massage therapist, now that you've been experiencing the, the pain of a massage therapy, might you buy a tool to help your problem? Okay, so we, and, wait, where was that other? Would you buy it? 100%, okay, so we've got two solid customers. But how many, how many, how many massage therapists do you think are out there in, in this country, in the world, in Germany? I don't know, kind of a lot, but maybe like, not everyone's, is anyone a massage therapist on their free time? No, okay, so, but who else? So we might, so we wanna think about our target market. We're gonna think, how many massage therapists are there in this world? Um, and then, what percentage of those massage therapists might wanna buy my product? How am I gonna reach them? But before we get too far into that, maybe we should think about who else might be in our target market? Individuals? Yeah, regular old people. <laughs> That's a very good point. What do you think? Physical therapist. Physical therapist as well? Okay. Yeah, different 
different type of therapist. Now, what's your name again? Sydney. Sydney. Okay, so Sydney's identified an interesting case of um, kind of like the longer term strategy. So he's both in the massage business and now he's thinking of maybe getting into the massage tool business, which is okay for Mark because he's going to make money off of this um, product, but he might be putting other people out of business. Who knows? Might be a substitute. Um, but who else? So we said just regular individuals. So as a regular individual, why might you want to buy a happy massager? It's like five to like twenty dollars compared to a massage therapist that can cost like eighty to two hundred dollars an hour. Oh, so it adds value at a lower cost. Okay, so this is good. So it, it has a substitute of the massage therapist, but it's a lot cheaper. So you can do it a lot more often. What do we got? Kind of going off of what she said, like it's nice, like it would, it might not also like put um, like massage therapist jobs like out because like if I were to buy it, I would use it, but then I'd also want someone else to do it because it feels nice to have someone else do like mm. the same thing. So it wouldn't be throughout the job because like say like you need a quick massage, like you would just do it yourself, but then if it like keeps coming out of something, like you'd have to go to someone else, like. Okay, yeah. Well, but what about your roommate or your boyfriend or girlfriend? Could that maybe be something you could be like, look, honey, I bought you this present. It's a <laughs> massager, you know, just to make your life easier so you can give me more massages. <laughs> That's true. There is some. So, so the happy so the happy massager is not going to replace a massage therapist entirely. Besides, they like put like candles and aromatherapy, and it's a whole experience. Um, but it still might serve a purpose. Do you think it would help? Do you think it would serve a purpose enough for an individual that they'd spend five to twenty bucks on it? Yeah, there's always Google for like pressure points. <laughs> yeah, you just watch a YouTube video. It's like way faster than massage <laughs> school, right? That's, uh, that's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> so, in terms of the target market. When we're thinking about um, when we're thinking about a target market, what do we have to do? We think we should choose to to just target the massage therapist, or choose to just target you know regular individuals, or maybe we need to, need to like further define this idea of like regular individuals of who would buy my product. You want to target as many people as possible. Because it. Okay, so the size of the target market matters. Um, but is there, if we try to target everyone, are there any downsides? Yeah, you don't want to spread yourself too thin. Right. Because not all customers are good. That's okay. <laughs> are they good for $5? Because that's what... <laughs> that's, uh, no, I don't... Return policy and stuff, I mean, you have issues with that, where people are a hassle and they're costing you more than they're making you. So okay. You have to that's a fair point. I feel like if you target to both... Um, Target markets, you would eliminate them in a way because you're targeting massage therapists because it'll, it's easier for them, but then you're also targeting individuals because, I mean, do you see what I mean? Like, they have Right, so you're thinking you're going to put the massage therapist out of business and they might not like to use yeah. the thing because then their customers are going to say, oh, well, I'll just buy it myself. Um, so it kind of depends on the market segmentation. Like, if, you know, and first of all, like, as a, um, you know, Mark is a massage therapist, so he might have more concern for the future of massage therapy. But as a regular entrepreneur, like that's not to say that's not your problem, that's something to consider. Um, but you, you want to focus on, you know, who is your target market, who's going to buy it. But if, when we're thinking between these different, um, different target markets, regular folks, um, first of all, the general public is never a perfectly, you know, it's not the best target market. We might want to get more specific um, because we want to have some characteristics. Because what happens once we choose a target market? Uh, what do we? What does that affect? What other aspects of the business does it affect? In the back. Your marketing and your messaging. Right, because we got to reach those those folks. Um, so determining who you're going to appeal to, who is your target market, then at, that affects your, your marketing, your branding strategy, um, a lot of, like even your company identity, which you can't necessarily change easily for different types of markets. But we need a market, but there's some other logistical aspects that we need to take care of, and Alex is going to take us to the next part.
Absolutely. So it seems like we're beginning to develop our business concept. We might have, for example, identified the, um, our target market as um, massage therapists or as regular folks. Let's just assume for the sake of the rest of the conversation that we're targeting, targeting regular folks. We've also begun to think about what our value proposition is and what would the value proposition in particular be for regular folks? What is the value that they're actually getting by purchasing this smiley face massager? Sorry? Saving time and money. How are, they, how are they saving time and money? They're not going to a massage therapist. So they're eliminating the need to go to a massage therapist, and they both, that's both costly, and it's also um, costly, costly in terms of money, costly in terms of time, as you need to go there. All right, so they're getting money and time. Awesome. So we move from here and begin to discuss how we're going to get this happy massager into the hands of customers. How are we going to deliver the value from Mark to regular folks? In a lot of ways, there's so much to consider. You know, you have Mark standing here with his idea of the happy massager, and he's wearing a t-shirt that says Mark on it because he's Mark. And then you have over here regular folk. And they're wearing t-shirts that say regular folk because they're regular folk. And they want, potentially, this happy massager. Help me get from one side of this idea to the other side. What are the links that we need to build? What are the practical steps that we need to take to make this idea a viable product that's being delivered to customers? Yes. Okay, so he needs a patent. All right. And the patent concept is interesting because if he secures that patent, does that help him to deliver the product from him to the regular folk? Not really. I, I saw some head shaking. It's not really. It's just like a necessary condition for it to make sense to deliver the product. So let's, before we get back to the patent, Let's get down these basic steps. How would we practically deliver this happy dream machine, whatever it's called, to regular folk? Yes, please. Promotion and advertising. Promotion and advertising. All right, so one of the steps that we need to cross this chasm would be marketing. Absolutely. What's another step? Oh, I'm sorry, did someone have their hand up back there? Yes. Okay. So an aspect of marketing might be a relationship with existing spas. All right. So relationships with potential distributors or advertisers. Yes, Dimitri. Has to do a prototype, right? Has to do a prototype. Has to develop the concept itself. Has Mark developed a prototype of the thingy, the happy massager, based upon what the case mentioned. So some heads nodding yes. How did he go about developing this prototype? A dream. Sorry? He had a dream. Oh, well, right. So he's got this dream, absolutely. First step, got the idea. How else did he develop this product concept? And I must warn you, I'm very, very comfortable with awkward silences. I have many awkward silences in my life, so they will, I am, I am not, <laughs> that's why I'm one of the reasons I'm single, so I, just, just, just test me. Yes. He went to the what? A wood dollar? What the heck is a wood dollar? Can you explain that, please? Yeah, he uses a lathe, something that cuts wood, I think. Is that, a, is that what a lathe is? I, th I think it's a, what a lathe is. Yeah, a wood lathe to be able to cut the wood. So he needs some sort of production prototype. So he has a prototype. 
Um, and that's maybe another link in the chain. What else? There's still so much room between Mark and actually selling this, this product. Yeah, please. Getting people to test it out. OK, absolutely. And I think this might be um, part of the prototype concept. And have people tested it out. Heads nodding. Yeah, who tested it out? Yeah, he tested it out on his students, exactly. All right, let's continue building these links. How else are we going to get from one side to the other? Sorry? Manufacturing. Manufacturing, absolutely. It's not enough to have a prototype. We now need to be able to um, produce these in mass. And that might involve the wood dollar. So we might need to contract with a wood dollar to be able to manufacture these products or services. Or we might want a bigger facility that makes things in mass. Another link. Manufacturing. Let's assume for the sake of our argument that we're going to use this same wood dollar. Let's say he has a larger shop um, is, is expanded and can produce many of these happy dollars. What do we need to provide to the wood dollar so that he can or she can manufacture this happy dollar? Yes? A patent. Do we need a patent? Maybe yes, maybe no. Arguments? A 3D design something specific. Okay. So, and, and the 3D design, the specifics, and maybe that would emerge from our prototype. CAD model. CAD model. Super specific, love it. So basically just detailed specifications as to how the product exists in the real world. Yes? So we need money to pay. Absolutely. One of the supporting conditions of perhaps not just one link, but multiple links, is he's going to need financing. So let's just think about that as like a, uh, a safety rope or a supporting mechanism down here, financing, that supports this entire process along the way. What's another practical step to connect Mark to those? Like yeah, research. regular folks. Market research? Yeah. Okay, he, knows he needs to know exactly who we're targeting. Yeah. Let's yeah. just... Competitors, people are going to buy it. Awesome. Let's assume for the sake of our argument that we've done that and that we've realized that a sufficient number of regular folk are willing to purchase this product at roughly the price at which it's going to be manufactured. For this, and it's an excellent point. Um, we'll come back to it in just a second. Yes? Uh, distribution. distribution. Right. So distribution at what stage here along the... Yeah. So if these are being manufactured, where do we need to get them next? To Mark. To Mark. All right. We need to get them to back to maybe a storage facility that Mark is operating. And then what is next? So that's a great point. Where should they, he be selling these? Where should Mark be selling these? Sorry? Retailers. All right. So let's say that the first part of our what are called outbound logistics is that he's moving these to retail stores. And then the next part is that, excuse me, that he's moving to his storage facility. And the next part of the outbound logistics is he's moving these to a retailer. What are other options? If we're not using retailers, yes? Partners. Like, what sort of partner? Yeah. So he could sell to, for example, I'm sure there are massage therapy um, websites or Brookstone. Yeah. So Brookstone might qualify as a retailer, but we might also have like other websites that are devoted, for example, to massage therapy, and you could sell to them. So this is a, a broader category. What else do we need to do? Warehouses. Warehouses? OK. So we, we, we're assuming that he has a warehouse. Here, so this is where he's storing. Yeah. How does the manufacturer get the supplies for these happy dollars? Oh, sorry, these happy massage balls. Sorry? 
suppliers. OK, so we need to figure out how we connect um, the manufacturing to the supplies. So here we're talking about inbound logistics. Where are we going to get the materials for the product itself? Does this complete the loop? What are we missing? What other parts of this chain do we need to be able to sell this product to regular folk? Sorry? Distribution to whom? Consumer. To the consumer. Directly to the consumer? OK, that's a, interesting, that's a different model. So instead of having the retailer involved here, we might go straight to the consumer. We might use Amazon, for example, and, and sell um, these uh, massage balls directly to the consumer, shipping them to their homes. Yes? It could be part of outbound, exactly. That would be part, part of outbound logistics. What else do the consumers need to buy this product? Yep, yeah, so they're built into the potentially the retailers here. Excellent point. But we already have kind of factored them in. This is where they will be picking this up. What if the consumers encounter a problem with it, with the product? Or service. Yeah, customer service, exactly. Broadly speaking, what we've begun to do is build out our value chain. Both the primary activities involved in the value chain in the inbound logistics, the manufacturing, the outbound logistics, the marketing, and the customer service and sales that are required to deliver the product um, to regular folk. We've also identified supporting mechanisms. Not only financing, but our discussion of patents are necessary to support the integrity of this entire process. However, this chain, while it exists in our minds, is it a good chain? Is it going to work? Or is it going to break down? What are ways in which this could break down? Or what are ways in which this might not be economical for us to pursue? <laughs> yes, Dimitri. He can't get the sales or the financing. He can't get the sales or the financing, absolutely. You can these might get knocked out. And sales might not um, come for what reasons? Absolutely. There just might not be demand. This link here might not exist, and this chain will come crashing down to reality. What's another reason? Yes? Is there a lack of understanding of what the product actually is? His lack of understanding of what the product is. How might that manifest in a problem in the value chain? Um, I would say it would probably fall under like marketing, I guess. And okay. Where it starts to get just kind of collapse that. Yeah, so again, we'd have this collapse here where people just wouldn't buy the product or service. Let's assume for the sake of our argument that people are willing to buy this um, by this by this product, how might else how might how might it break down in other ways, Dimitri? Uh, the scale, like you might have too many orders. Like uh, right, so you might hit problems with inbound logistics, manufacturing, and outbound logistics due to supply issues and, and over demand, and people might become disinterested. What other ways? Yes. The prototype might not work, absolutely. So the, the concept might break down. It might crack when people actually use it on someone's back. Where, how else? Competitors. That's ex an excellent point. So this chain, while it might be a good one, it might stand up. You might have the prototype work. The inbound logistics might work. It might be relatively inefficient. You might have another chain that a competitor builds that is far more effective. That's one possibility. And people might choose to get this product through another chain. Yes? And then <coughs> throughout that whole chain, you have to be able to navigate through the, the legal system. Like mm -hmm. when it comes to like creating a product or business, there's a lot to consider and law, and you have to like do things right, otherwise it'll come back at the end. Yeah. That's another one of the supporting mechanisms down here is a legal team that understands what the ramifications might be that if one of these little balls comes off and you stab your partner in the back with this massage device, what do you do then? How do you overcome that potential lawsuit? Yes? Absolutely. The margins can be too small. So while he's selling this, his financing is diminishing at a rate in which it undermines his business concept. Absolutely. What are some other 
ways in which, what are some other reasons why people might choose um, a, a different form of value? What are some other different forms of value that are similar to this product concept? Yeah. Well, I know now that there's one similar design around this electric, so it's like vibrating. Okay. So that would be like oh, yeah, so there might be a vibrating version of this, and they might choose that product Peace. over this product. So there might be factors out there in the competition, in the overall industry, that make this value chain um, irrelevant. I'll stop right there and hand it over to Glenn. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I was back say, like, the, the materials that are being used from wood is lower. Exactly. It doesn't necessarily have to vibrate. It could be a different set of materials. Maybe rubber feels a lot better on your back than wood. Maybe you get splinters from the wood. All right, thank you, thank you. So now we're at the point where is, is it a product or, or can he make this out of a business? I mean, someone mentioned the word patent. If, if, if uh, Mark is going to protect his investment, he will need that patent. But, you know, he has this one item, and I think you all said it's made out of wood. It's, it's, a, it's a simple process, even though there's some 3D involved, where therefore you need some skill in order to be able to manufacture this product. So now you all mentioned earlier also that, you know, Mark didn't want to stick to anything for very long, but I guess after he got a little older, he found something that he loved and he became a teacher. Is this where most inventions take place? They take place at home once you find what you love, you decide to invent it, and then you have to decide if you just want to stick with this one product, just get your patent and sell it to some big retail and let them handle the rest? Or do you want to hold tight to it and you be the actual seller of your product? And that's where you are getting to the margin as opposed to the volume. And will it be around for a lengthy period of time or will competitors come up with a better product? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that that one particular item is easy to duplicate? So if it's easily duplicated, what's the likelihood of his sustainability with this just one product that he is taking to market? So for the, you all that are interested in, in, in start, you know, inventing something, these are the types of questions you have to think about. Well, I'm here to talk about Mark himself, and I, and I need your help. Because, you know, you, you, you said that, you know, he got this product, he's, he's done a little pilot program by giving it to other massage therapist and to his friends and to his students, you know, so they can practice on others with it. And I think we have some people who would definitely agree that, all right, we are solving a problem because their thumb started to hurt and you hadn't even given the customer his money's worth. What was that, five minutes? You know, 10 minutes and someone said that may cost you $80? Oh my goodness. So Mark, I need your help. Now, now Mark did a lot of things in that case. He, he did a lot of things. And when you went through this with Alex, you mentioned some skills, some skills. And those of you all have taken that small business finance class. You know, it talks about the different things in that business plan that is required. It is required, and that's why we have students that do business plans. We have people who've been in business 10 years. We still have them to do a business plan when they want to bring a new product to market and they want to borrow somebody else's money. So I need your help. What type of skills did Mark have when he uh, first got into creating uh, this little happy right here? What had he already been exposed to? Where did he work before? Okay, you said he worked with an air conditioning firm. He may have some, some logistics about manufacturing and technology. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you said some marketing was required in, in getting this, this, this product to market and things of that nature. So he had a little background in that as well. Any other background uh, experience that Mark may have had some skills that he may have ob obtained along the way? Yes, sir. Great, so with all of these skills and experience that Mark has, has gained along the way, he could very well 
move from a product to a business. Now, as small business owners, we find ourselves when we first start out, we have to do all those tasks ourselves until we can create that team, until we can grow enough to be able to pay somebody else to help us out. Now, I really want Mark to be able to get this patent before, you know, it's a little too late because in that patent paperwork, they start to ask you a whole lot of questions. Does it exist somewhere else? Does someone else has this, have this name? Is it easily duplicated? All of those questions are asked, and before we know it, someone else would have already jumped out there and Mark would, Mark would never get his product to, to market in the first place. So we understand that he definitely has some skills that he can uh, bring this product to market. So uh, we can actually create a business based upon what he has. Now this is just one product it, itself. Now would it help if Mark had come up with some, some other products related to massage therapy and things of that nature, whereby if he was to create a business and once these products get out there, he can have some other products that could expand uh, his sales in order that he can stay in business. Because with this rum product, and you said, you know, once you, you know, if it's easily duplicated, would his sales eventually start to decline after a period of time if it's just this one product? If you were Mark, what other things would you target? What else, you know, what other ideas would come to mind to kind of help you sustain your business if you wanted to add some more products to it? What was that? Mm -hmm. to, like, when the customer is going to try it, they will be completely satisfied. So the competitor, uh, they have to like maybe invest more. So they will say like it's going to be more expensive for the competitor. So it's going to be more affordable to his product or her product. So she said he should consider some of the materials he's already using to try and come up with some other products related close to it in order to be able to uh, benefit uh, from the uh, manufacturing process he already has. I need your help. You know, we mentioned some of the skills Mark had. What, are, what do you think are some of the characteristics of an entrepreneur? You know, those people who just, you know, can get out there and do it. What type of characteristics you think an entrepreneur should have? They're pretty really outgoing and able to talk to people well and communicate what they want. Okay, could she help me out? She yeah, said absolutely. outgoing. So, so just to, okay. we're running a little bit short of time. Okay, so, I have one more. Yeah. Okay, so she said you have to be driven. We said they have a low tolerance for all of this red tape. They can't stand to take no for an answer. You know, some of those characteristics may be some that you all have, and that is what it will take for Mark to move this from a product to a business. So I think, uh, do you all think that Mark can actually get there and, and grow it into a large sales dollars and things of that nature? What do you think? Is Mark the right person for this opportunity? Right if persistence and communication skills are particularly important, and let's say that he sells his product not only in the United States, but in Germany, what factors might make him either a good candidate or a bad candidate for this business opportunity? Is he fluent in German? Yes. Taking it might get more exposure. Fair enough. But is Mark, that's an excellent point, but is Mark the right person? Do you think he has the wherewithal to be able to run this business, Brian? Uh, Mark kind of kind of gives off a lot on ideas, unfortunately, kind of flip flops. So yeah, if he stuck with it, he would be, I think, the right person. But if he, if he doesn't stick with it, then no. Absolutely. So what we've done here is we've better uh, fleshed out the actual value proposition. I want to put an emphasis on that proposition. What we've also done is articulated the process of delivering that proposition, of executing that proposition um, process. And we've highlighted a number of potential concerns, both within his proposed value chain, or his assumed value chain, and alternatives to the product itself, so factors in the broader industry. We've also begun to identify then critical factors in the people that would be carrying out this idea. Principally, at this stage, that's just Mark. Mark might or might not be the right person for this business opportunity. What's important as you think about taking 
which you, I guarantee you will have, good ideas of various different products out there in the world is to move from the idea of a product to a product concept, to a business concept. The steps that we've taken considering the proposition, the process, and the people are the fundamental steps in that. It's a useful, overly simplistic, I admit, heuristic, but it's a good one to help you think critically about whether a product can be turned into an overall business concept. Thank you very much. Good job, team. Once again, fill out the, fill out the reviews. Uh, I actually know Mark Moraes quite well. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, you hit it really well. He's just an idea guy. He has more ideas and he knows what to do with. He's just a brilliant, fun guy. The, for the Happy Company, which is the name of this company, is called The Happy Company. Their tagline is, anything's possible. That's actually their tagline, anything's possible. Just so you know, after five years after he introduced The Happy Massager, did you guys ever look it up? Yeah. Five oh, years yeah. after he looked, he, he entered this company, he sold $30 million worth of these things. Mark has sold over $150 million worth of these things, but guess what? It never had a chance of replacing the massage industry, because those of you who are up here doing it, when you go to get a massage, you want someone hands on you. This was a big gift gift. Nordstrom's, Bed Bath & Beyond, Body Works sold most of their product. They couldn't even keep up with the demand, because it became a gift. And so to her, somebody's point was brilliant around making other wood products. They, he makes things for feet massagers. He makes all kinds of really cool stuff. And his company is kind of neat, but Mark has one big challenge. He has one Achilles heel. He's an idea person. He's not a finance person. Mark actually really struggles with running his own company. So he's had to bring in good managers to help him actually help him run that company because he almost lost the company five, five years in. He was selling $30 million worth a year, and he couldn't figure out how to get his staff, his manufacturing, and his people together. And people said, this is not a very happy company. We make happy <laughs> products, but it's not a very happy company. So sometimes the journey of being an entrepreneur is really fraught with danger. But uh, fundamentally, something as simple as this, he made 30 million, he, he's made a lot of money doing this. Oh, yeah. He's got a neat nonprofit now. Where, oh, really? Where, where he actually helps people bring happiness around the world. So oh, he's just a very right. eclectic dude. You're right. Yeah. He, he's actually wearing a t-shirt that says Mark. Is this Mark? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, I'm like, do you know Mark? Or Mark? <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here. You guys are Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very much for coming.